Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. To God be the glory for the great things he has done. We give God praise. Thank God for your lives. Thank God for the opportunity to share with you God's word on this special day that is recognized around the world. Uh, people remember what the Lord Jesus did for us on the cross. Hallelujah. The first thing I just want to say is, I praise God that, first thing I want to say is, that whether this is the actual date he, Jesus died or not really is not the point. Most important thing is that he did die. Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again. Uh, when John the Apostle saw Jesus in a vision on the island of Patmos, our Lord said to him, I'm he, I'm he that lived and died but I am alive and I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Amen. So the fact is that after his resurrection, he did say to John, John, you know me, I lived, I died, and now I'm risen. Uh, not only as a lamb of God, but as the king of kings, praise God. So I want us to go to God in prayer. Father, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We celebrate his death and his resurrection. We thank you that Christ indeed came, he died, and he rose again, and in him we have life. Uh, we remember all over the world, we remember in this season what he did for us. We remember your great love for us, and we thank you for your goodness we thank you for your mercies we thank you for your love your grace all the blessings of god that make rich to which you have no sorrow that you you have bestowed on us through jesus our lord thank you father we honor you we magnify you in jesus name amen amen amen, amen. praise god well I want to talk about two two scriptures. I want to bring two scriptures to your attention. Uh, obviously, most of you know uh, uh, that Jesus Christ died for us, you know, and was raised from the dead for us. We'll come to that, but I want to show you these two scriptures that the Lord has put on my heart about the certainty of the things that we have believed in the assurance that we have. Uh, so let's go to Luke chapter 1. Uh, the gospel. This is the gospel of Luke chapter 1. And after that, I'm going to show, take you to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. For now, though, let's turn to Luke chapter 1. And... I want to read from verse 1 to verse 4. Luke chapter 1. Hallelujah. If you come to Luke 1, verse 1 to 4. All right. It says, For as much as many have taken in hand, to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they deliver them unto us, who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very beginning, to write unto you, in order, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know, that you may know, so he tells him his objective, that you may know the certainty 
that you may know the certainty of those things wherein you have been instructed. That you may know the certainty of the things that you've been instructed in. This is the, uh, this is Dr. Luke, right in the Gospel of Luke. And here it appears that it's addressed to uh, Theophilus. You know, it, it, it is actually addressed to Theophilus uh, and some eminent person. He tells him about Jesus Christ how Jesus was save us from our sins. So the gospel of Luke starts about how the angel came to announce to Mary that she would conceive God's son. Mary says to the angel, let it be to me according to your word. Mary conceives the word. This is why John later wrote in John chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So, and the word became flesh. That's the incarnation. The word that was eternal. In John 1 verse 1, He's called the Word of God. John called him the Word of God a second time. In Revelation, and I'll read this to you. Watch this. Twice John called Jesus the Word of God. In Revelation 19, in verse 13, it says, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. His name is called the Word of God. So John describing Jesus in Revelation 19 and verse 13 calls him the Word of God. Now remember in John 1, verse 1, and most of you know it. If you don't, you can check it out later for yourself in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14. But John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Then verse 14 says, The Word became flesh. So that is the conception of Jesus by Mary the Virgin and the birth of Jesus. Jesus coming into the world was actually God coming into the world. But why did God do that? God did that. Most of the time, let me just say what most people know and think of, because he loves us. So I'll get that out of the way. God came to save us because he loves us. But I want you to actually understand that there's a different reason for the cross. Jesus did not go to the cross because God loves us. Jesus went to the cross because of God's justice. It's important that you get this, that this Easter, you'll understand the Easter message clearly. Yes, God so loved us, he sent Jesus to save us. Yes, God so loved us, he came down. God became flesh. That's God the Word, not God the Father. Because John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. So there's God the, God the Father, and there's God the Word. Then there's God the Holy Spirit. Well, God the Word became flesh. He grows up at the age of 30. He starts 
his public ministry. By the way, he grows up under his mother Mary and one who was supposed to be his father, Joseph. So Jesus is with them. And we see him at the age of 12 in the temple, talking with the doctors of the law about God's word. It's the reason why I've gone back to his age at 12. Now, from the age of 12, it appears that we don't hear anything about him till he's 30. Most people have been told that, but that's not true. I repeat, at the age of 12, he's mentioned in the Bible as being in the temple. And scripture says he went home with his parents. You know, we know when they returned from Jerusalem to go home and realized later on that he was not with them, they went back to Jerusalem looking everywhere for him, couldn't find him. Then eventually, after looking everywhere, they went to the temple and they found him in the temple. And he said something to them. Most people have not asked why he said that. He said to them, the, the mother said, but son, we look for you everywhere. We look for you everywhere. And, and he said, why? Didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? I must be about you know this part, right? I must be about my father's business. My father's business. Why did he say that to them, the mother? Why, would, why did he expect the mother to know that now at his age, he would be enrolled in his father's business as an apprentice learning his father's business, because he was now, he had come to the age where a Jewish young man would be enrolled in the, in a, as an apprentice in the, in the father's business. Do you get it? This is why he said to Mary, you, sh you should have looked for me first. You should have looked for me first in my father's house because because I am now at the age as a Jewish young man who's began, who's began studying, you know, apprenticeship with my father. And I need for you to understand that. In case you've wondered, I know some people have wondered why, how is it that the parents, how is it that the parents went has the parents went a distance before realizing that has the, the parents went a distance before realizing that Jesus wasn't there? You ever wonder why Jesus wasn't there with them? It was because Mary thought he was with Joseph, and Joseph thought he was with Mary. That's how come they lost him. I repeat. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mary thought <laughs> Jesus was with Joseph. Why? Because now that he has had his bar mitzvah, as a young Jewish man, he would begin hanging out with the men. He's now officially a man. So he would no longer be with the women, be with the mother and the women. He would be with his father. His father, Mary thinks, his father, Joseph. Are you following this? Praise the Lord. Excuse me. Praise God. Excuse me. Uh, just, just pay attention. Amen. If you can just be quiet and just receive the word. Praise God. So I know there's a, some excitement now. Amen. It's helpful that uh, you just receive the word. Because I'm touching on a number of things that are new to some people. Not to some of you, all of you, but to some people. So let's bear with them as, as they listen. And, you know, 
Anyway, we should know this. Jesus was Jewish. As a Jewish young man, at the age of 12, 13, 12 or 13, you begin to learn a trade. Most of them will begin to learn their father's trade. Joseph was a carpenter. We know Jesus was a carpenter. Right? He was referred to as the carpenter's son. People referred to him when he started his ministry, referred to him as a carpenter. So if anybody tells you that the last time Jesus is mentioned in the Bible growing up was 12, and then he's, when he's 30, he starts his ministry. So there are 18 years, and people call that the 18 missing years of Jesus. They are not missing years of Jesus. They are not. The Bible talks about it if you pay attention. Why are they not missing years? Because when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, Jesus began his public ministry. He went into the temple, the synagogue, in his hometown, Nazareth, in Luke 4, it says where he had been raised up, brought up. And as his custom was, as it was customary of him, his habit, his behavior, he goes to the temple and he reads. So when we find him at age 30, beginning his ministry, the record of him is that before age 30, it was customary of him to be coming to the temple to read. So he didn't travel outside of Israel to Africa, India, or anywhere to study with the ancient masters. No, he was from Israel and did not travel outside Israel. I hope that you get that. Now go back to when he was 12. When he was 12, scripture says, after the parents found him, he went home with them and submitted himself to them. So from the age of 12, he goes home with them. He didn't travel somewhere and he submits himself to them. Next time we hear about him, he's 30 years old. And the scripture says, as was customary of him, he goes to the synagogue in his hometown and he reads. When he started his ministry, people referred to him as the carpenter. Before the age of 30, his job was what? A carpenter. So, in the natural, he was about his earthly, supposedly, father's business. Of course, he did not have an earthly father. His father was God. That's why when Mary, looked, Mary and Joseph looked for him, he told them, you should have come to the temple because... I'm at the age where I enroll in my father's business. A Jewish young man becomes a man, age 13, thereabouts, at his bar mitzvah, he starts the father's business. And notice something, when Jesus told Mary that I must be about my father's business, Mary did not complain. Mary did not say, Who's your father? Because Mary was the only one who knew that his father was God. And that day, Jesus is saying, I must be about my father's business in the house of God. Amen. Do you get it? Now, let's relate the house of God to you and to me. The Bible says we are the temple of God. Now that you are born again, you have become the temple of God. God lives in you by his spirit. Jesus does not live in you. Jesus, we're correcting a lot of things tonight. Jesus lives in heaven. Didn't you read in the Bible, it says he sits on the right hand side of God. 
There's nowhere in the Bible it says, receive Jesus into your heart. We say that. Evangelists say that. But Jesus is not in your little heart, in your body. No. You received Jesus by believing in his death and resurrection, which has already happened. It didn't happen tonight that everybody says everywhere in the world is Good Friday. No, it already happened. We are just remembering what happened. Are you understanding this? Yes, it's already happened. Now, when you believed in what Jesus did for you on the cross, he came with the Father to live in you by the Spirit. Jesus said, Jesus and the Father will come and make their dwelling in us. But how did they do it? They did it by the Holy Spirit. This is why we can pray this prayer over you, that the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you, the love of God be with you, and the power, the fellowship, the anointing, the koinonia, communion, the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, everything of the Holy Spirit be with you. Only born-again Christians can say that. There is no religion on this earth that can say that. Why? Because no religion believes that Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and the Father is God. Only Christianity believes that. Why is it so necessary that we believe and be assured of the grace of Jesus being with us? The power of the Holy Spirit being with us? The love of God being with us? Why? Why is it important? This is why it's important. Get ready for this. Remember Jesus said, when he prayed that great prayer before he was crucified on the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane, recorded in John 17. He said, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you from the very beginning before I came to this earth. So in John 17, Jesus was saying, he is different from the Father, but he was equal to the Father and shared the same glory with the Father. Jesus Christ is not God the Father. Some people teach that Jesus is God the Father. No, Jesus was God. Not God the Father, but God the Word. When you read 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, I repeat, when you read 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, it says there are three not three gods, but three persons in heaven that bear record as one God. And these three are the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Amen. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. The reason why it's important that you know that you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit living in you by the Spirit because the Father and Jesus are in heaven. Jesus is not in your little heart or my little heart. No, it is the Holy Spirit who lives in us. The Spirit of Christ lives in us. The Spirit of God lives in us. That's how they live in us. But Jesus said he had glory with the Father before he came to the earth. And he said, now that I've finished the work, glorify me now that I'm going to go to the cross and you're going to raise me up. Glorify me with the glory I had with you which I put aside to become human. Give it back to me. <laughs> Amen. This is John 17. Okay. But Jesus said something else. He said, Father, let those who believe on me, Christians, born again believers, those of us who believe in Jesus, he said, let them walk in love experience and live in the love that you had for me. 
get this, the love that you had for me from eternity. Why is it necessary that we know that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? It is because nobody by themselves alone can love. Let me repeat that. This will change. This Easter season, your life is changed forever if you catch this revelation. No human being can love by themselves. No person, no crea created being can love by themselves. And the creator himself alone cannot love. Love is incomplete unless it can be shared, unless it can be given. And the Lord Jesus gave us, clued us into this. He said, Father, let Christians, I mean, I'm saying Christians because now we're called Christians. But he said, let those who believe in me, let them experience, live with, walk in the love that I had with you and you had for me. Didn't Jesus pray in John 17? And he said, Father, thank you that you love them the same way you've loved me. Amen. Amen. So I want you to know that the love that God loved Jesus with, he loves you with the same love. And it is that love that made God raise Jesus from the dead. And I stand to declare to you by faith in God that God will raise your body. He will raise your sick body. He will raise their mind that is confused. He will raise it out of the pit of confusion. How do we know that? Doesn't Isaiah say to us in Isaiah 53 that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed so that you have peace of mind jesus wore a crown of thorns quietly without opposing rejecting it he wore it because he knew he was taking your confusion of mind it is time that you and i born again believers become certain fully persuaded of these things that Christ died that we may live. That Christ was beaten on his back that we may be healed. And stop listening to people who tell you that when it comes to healing of your body, you have to ask God, Lord, is it your will? How dare we? When God already said, I am the Lord that heals you. I will take sickness away from you. It is time for you to know the certainty of these things. So Dr. Luke writes to Luke. Excuse me. Dr. Luke writes to Theophilus and he says, I want you to know the certainty of these things. The other scripture that I want to show you is Philippians 1 verse 6. In Philippians 1 verse 6, please, let's read that. Oh, this, this Easter season, your life has changed forever. Because you are receiving insight and revelation concerning what Jesus Christ did for us. In Philippians chapter 1 and, and, and verse 6, it says, Being confident, being confident of this very thing, that he who has began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Be confident, be fully persuaded that God is able to do what he has said he would do. He said he was wounded for our transgressions. That means you are not to be wounded for wounds to destroy you. All pressures will come, stresses will come, but the Lord is your peace. He will give you rest for there remains a rest for the people of God. Stress will come. But he said in Matthew chapter 11. Didn't he say that in Matthew eleven twenty eight? 28? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. If you are stressed, he says, come to me and I will give you rest. Do you believe that? Then go to him. If you believe his word, go to him. Luke says, I'm writing to you that you may know the certainty of these things. Be fully assured that God is good. So in case you ever wondered, why is it even necessary to know about the Trinity? Why is there even a Trinity? 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They say it's three persons in one. Today you found out why. It is necessary because one God by himself alone, one person cannot love. Let's take it slowly. <laughs> God, the person that in the Bible who created the world, Moses met. Noah met him. He talked to Noah. He talked to Moses, Abraham. We all know him as God. The Israelites came to know him as God. Then progressively in the Bible, he was always God. Now, when we come into the New Testament, we come into the New Testament, and then we find that there is a, a person who starts saying things like, he is also God. And the Jewish people are like, no, we got a problem with this. We have always known, you know, the God of Moses, you know, the God of our fathers. So how come you are saying you and the Father are one? You see, and that's why the Jews, that's why they crucified Jesus. Because they couldn't handle the fact that, it's, oh, hear, oh, Israel, the Lord our God is one. You know that? From Deuteronomy 4, 6. Hear, oh, Israel, the Lord our God is one. They knew God is one. And we don't say God is two, God is three or more. Believers, we believe, just like the Jews, that God is one. But this one God is manifested in three persons. The first person we come to know as God the Father, because he's the one who spoke the word. And Mary said, let it happen to me as you have said. So she received the word, conceives the word, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the word she believes becomes life in this virgin. And then the normal time it takes a woman to conceive and bear a son, she gives birth to a son. That had been prophesied by the prophet Micah. If you are taking notes, please write it down. It was prophesied 600 years before he was born. The prophet Micah, Micah 5 and verse 2. Micah 5 and verse 2. Micah not only told us that the person who would be born is an eternal being, but he tells us the town. He said, one will come to be born in Israel, in Bethlehem, Ephrata. Ephrata means fruitful. Bethlehem means house of bread. So this person who is coming will become the bread of life. He become provision for humanity. He will provide righteousness. This is why when we get born again in Psalm 23, the psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Why? Because provision has come. Do you catch that? Let me repeat it. Everybody knows Psalm 23. It starts how? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What's the, what's the, uh, the psalmist saying? He's saying something you've read before. We were all going astray, as sheep going astray. But we have returned to the bishop and shepherd of our souls, Jesus Christ. So when he becomes your shepherd, you shall not lack. Because he's your Yahweh Yireh. You are, he's your, you call it Jehovah Jireh. That is Yahweh Yire, God who provides. He provided Jesus, the lamb for the sacrifice to take away the sins of humanity, to reconcile us to God, to give us God's glory once again. Amen. That man will experience the love of God. And you've learned today the reason why we had to have the Father the Son, the Holy Spirit revealed to us. Come and live in us. Enjoy the grace of our Lord Jesus. The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is because if God had been by himself alone, he would have been very frustrated that there was nobody to share love with. If you want love, share it. 
Let me, let me repeat that. <laughs> Didn't the Bible say those who want friends should do what? Show themselves friendly. In this world, people complain all the time. Nobody cares about me. Well, who do you care? Who have you cared about? Reach out. Give. And it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaking together, running over. I pray that you catch this. Ladies and gentlemen, if God had been by himself for eternity all alone, and we know God is love. The Bible says God is love. But who was he sharing that love with? He was sharing that love with God the Word and God the Spirit. Jesus said it. He said, you have loved me from the very foundations of this world. You've loved me in eternity. And God created us to share this love, his love with. God gave birth to us in Christ so that the love that he shared with Christ, we will have that love. If you want love, love people. Look at God. Look at God. I mean, I make mistakes. I sin. I mess up. Just like you. Just like any human being. But God still loves us. Look at that. Just, just look at that. So, real love, unconditional love, actually is to give it, give it out. Without expecting anything in return. But the good thing is this. When you give, it will come back to you. It will surely come back to you. Because what you sow, you reap. Sometimes our problem is that when we give, we expect to get it back a certain way. Don't do that. Don't do that. Amen. Just just give. Just give. Amen. So today you learn this. Why should we even have the Trinity? Three persons in one. Of course, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. It just means three united. Three united as one. Well, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, they are united as one. Let me ask you, for those of you who are married, those of you who are married, there are two of you. You are two separate persons, wonderful persons, unique, great, beautiful persons. Yet, in marriage, you are one. So why can't God the Father and God the Word also be two separate persons, yet be one? And that's all they said. They didn't say we are two gods. They didn't say we are three gods. That's only one God. But that one God has manifested himself as God the Father who wants you to have his love. He loves you with perfect love. Even if you don't love him back, he won't change his mind. May your family begin to experience this and watch the transformation that will come in the family. Watch the good that will come back to you. I pray that this Easter season you have been blessed. You have understood beyond any shadow of doubt from the message God gave me to give to you to know the certainty of these things that God came for you. He loved you so much. He came for you. But to save you, God had to be judged. That is amazing to me. Oh, look at that. God the Father is a holy God. Absolutely holy. Not like us. He's absolutely holy. So when you sin against him, for him to accept you and to fellowship with you, you have to, he has to remove the sin. And he has to put you on a level where he can fellowship with you, be one with you and you one with him. And the only way he can do that is to put himself into you. For God to fellowship with you, he has to put a part of him into you. It's not hard to conceive that. When God created Adam, he breathed his breath into Adam. And Adam became alive. You understand that? And Adam mm -hmm. was created to express the image and the likeness of God. God wants us to reflect him in the earth. Amen. So Adam was able to fellowship with God. God was able to fellowship with Adam. Because as a part of God, he had put in Adam. 
So when God came to talk to Adam, the part of God in God that related to Adam was, you know, for example, bear with me, I say, was like on a frequency, you know, the code inside of Adam met the code inside of God so they could talk the same language. You understand that? Because Adam is human and God is almighty God. They can't communicate. So for God to communicate with Adam, God puts his spirit into Adam. So God talks to his spirit that is inside Adam. And that spirit in Adam communicates to Adam's mind. It's really the same way God talks to us today. God doesn't talk to my mind or your mind. God talks to our spirit. But how, how will our spirit hear God? Because God has put his spirit in us through you and I believing in Jesus. And for all of this to be made possible, unfortunately, because Adam sinned, Adam gets separated from God. So God has to judge man's sin. Amen. He has to judge man's sin because he's holy. Just like in this world, we have judges. You know, to have a normal, sane society and to remove criminals who destroy the rest of society so nothing, society doesn't fall apart, they separate the criminals from regular society. It's the same in the spirit realm. A holy God is just. And he says, if you sin, the wages of sin is death. A lot of people don't understand. They think God is just like wicked, you know, and he's just going to judge you when you do something wrong. No, 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 no. That's not how it is. The reason why I teach you tonight, the reason why God has to judge sin is because when sin comes into a person or comes into his world, it, the world, the person is no longer innocent. They lost something. And you can't, you can't get it back. But God wants you to have that innocence back. So what has come in to destroy you, God has to cut it off. If he doesn't cut it off, it will destroy the person completely. It's just like on earth. Sometimes, I'm not a medical doctor, so forgive me. But I'll say this loosely. Sometimes there's some kind of disease that attacks a person. You know, maybe they are some part of their extremities. And the doctors will say they have to take that part off. Otherwise, it's going to grow and get into the heart or the lungs or, and destroy the whole person. So they, they cut off that extremity, that part. So God is like that. Sin comes and he has to cut it off. And the way to cut it off is to let it die. If it doesn't die, it will continue. And eventually destroy the person and destroy the rest of this of this world. That is why the punishment of sin is death. Death is what stops whatever has started. Amen. But praise God. I think people are still trying to follow this uh, on the radio and on the phone. So there's a bit of feedback. For, forgive us, you know. And let's forgive them. I'm talking about love. So let's be patient. We'll bear with them. <laughs> Amen. All right. So this Easter, please understand this. God loves us, so he saved us. But the main reason why Jesus was crucified was not because of love. It was because of justice. It's because of justice. Because if you think about it, to love us, why did Jesus have to be punished? Why? And why that cruel way? Think about it. The cross was the place of judgment. It wasn't even a place of love. It was a place of judgment. Let me read that to you. This is it's always been in the Bible. Unfortunately, tradition has taught us differently. But let me read it to you. John 12. Please write it down so you can check it out. Later, you can search the scriptures for yourself. But come with me to John 12. This Easter, you learn from God that he has already judged Jesus for you. So you have passed from judgment to life. God won't judge you ever again. Mm -mm. It's, it's over. It's over. It really grieves my heart when, like, something, there's a tragedy, you know, 
there, there's a snowstorm, people die, or there's a, God forbid, plane crash. Or even when 9-11 happened in America, some people are like, that's God's judgment. No, stop saying that. That's not God's judgment. God already judged our sins in Jesus. Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. The cross was not a place of love. The cross was God's justice that was meted out on Jesus for us. And it's done. It's, it's done. God will no longer judge us. No, that's not going to be double jeopardy. We have been judged. We were crucified with Christ. We were buried with Christ. We have been raised with Christ. The Bible says all of that. You can search it for yourself. Paul says in Galatians 2 and verse 20. Galatians 2 verse 20. He said, I'm, I'm crucified with Christ. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Jesus' faith. Not even Paul's faith. Not your faith, but Jesus' faith. Instead of focusing on Jesus, today we have people who are like, oh, I, I follow Paul. You know, I follow Paul's teachings. The Paul in Revelation. No, 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 no. Follow Jesus. Paul got his revelation from Jesus. Go to Jesus. Some say, I follow Peter. You know, Peter is the first pope. No, 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 no. Follow Jesus. He said, I will build my church. He didn't say, uh, Peter will build his church. He said, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. I will build my church. He didn't say, we are Peter's church. He said, my goodness. He said, my church. Follow Jesus. He died to save you from sin. And I repeat, you will never be judged anymore. Because in John 5, he said, you have passed from judgment to life. Because Jesus has been judged. God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all sin. He's just to who? Me? No, 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 no. He's just to Jesus. Me, I have sinned. All have sinned. If you have sinned, God is not just to you. He's just to the person, Jesus, who never sinned, but paid the price for our sins. Because Jesus has paid the price, God will no longer hold us accountable. No, he has forgiven us. As far as the east is from the west, God has set our sins away from us. It's, that's from Psalm 103. And you, you use that to tell you this. East and West are not like North and South. East and West don't have finite points. You have the South Pole. You have the North Pole. They are finite points. But East and West don't have finite points. So when God says to Psalm 103, as far as the East is from the West, he sets your sins away from you. What God is saying, is that he's buried your sins in the depths of the sea and you never find them. So have a consciousness of righteousness, not a consciousness of sin. Let's not focus on sin. Focus on righteousness. If you are struggling with some area of your life, focus on Jesus. He will help you. He will live his life through you. We were crucified with Christ. We were buried with Christ. And we are risen with Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't even happen every Easter. It happened over 2,000 years ago. It's already done. It's settled. Now watch this. John 12, verse 31 to 33. I repeat so you can study this. John chapter 12, verse 31 to 33. This is to show you that the cross was a place of judgment. All right? We're about to end, so pay attention before I pray. John 12, 31 to what? 33. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sake. Your sakes. Now, now, what time? Now, watch this. Now is the judgment of this world. Oh, there it is. As the young people would say, boom, there it is. <laughs> now is the judgment of this world. Now, when? Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Here he was referring to the devil. 
Then verse 32 talks about himself. He says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Verse 33, this he said, signifying what death he should die. What death did Jesus die on the cross? You see, he was crucified. He was cursed so that we would be blessed. Don't listen to false prophets telling you you have a curse. Your name is on some altar. It is in the ocean. It is in some grave. There's a curse chasing you. No, 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 no. Goodness and mercy are chasing you. Amen. May goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. Choose to believe that. Christ was made a curse. That is the reality. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8. It says, if the devil had known that in crucifying Jesus, we would be free, he would not have done it. What I just read to you, it's explained by Paul. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8. If the devil had known that in crucifying Jesus, we would be free from the devil. The devil would not have crucified him. As much as he hated Jesus, he would have left him alone. Because crucifying Jesus set us free. Why? Because the crucifixion of Jesus was the judgment of this world. Where the prince of this world, Satan, was dethroned was cast out so this easter remember this god judged the devil on the cross for you how god put all the judgment of our sins upon jesus the handwriting of ordinances against us were nailed to the cross when they were nailing his hands to the cross they had no idea that they were nailing all the tickets against us to the cross. There's no more judgment awaiting you. It's been nailed to the cross and Christ has been raised from the dead. Amen. One more scripture and then we pray. Now this scripture, you know, everybody knows. If you've ever watched American football, you have seen John 3, 16. Right? You know it. Everybody knows it. So let's go there. John 3, 16. Let's just read it. I know you know it, but Let's read it. It says, let's go. One, two, three, read. You can even say it without reading. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Now, I'll read verse 17, and, I'll, and we'll see something else today. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him may be saved. If you choose Christ today, salvation is yours. But salvation is from sin and all the effects of sin. Salvation is from mental confusion, from emotional trauma, brokenheartedness. Yes, from physical ailments diseases believe this today these things are written to you that you may know the certainty of the truth that christ died for our sins and was raised up for us to be declared righteous to be justified that is a legal issue it's like going to court and the judge says you are not guilty it doesn't matter what anybody thinks once the gavel comes down, not guilty, that's it. You're free to go. Well, God said you are not guilty, free to go. Why am I not guilty? Christ has paid and wiped away my sins. Yes, God has placed his righteousness on us. Amen. But watch this. Watch this. If you never really thought about this, watch this now. So remember, we read John 3.16. You know it. So this is not be, it will not be confusing. John 3.16, God so loved the world. And we established that God's love brought Christ to save us. Yes. But I taught you that the cross 
was a place of judgment. And I showed it to you in John chapter 12, verses 31 to 33. It was a place of judgment. But it's also here in John 3. We know verse 16, if you have what is called a red letter edition, where the, the Bible, the red letters are what Jesus himself said, we know John 3, 16 is in red. But in case you never thought about it, let's look at it again. How does verse 16 start? John 3, 16. How does it start? It, it doesn't say God so loved the world. He's, it starts this way. For God so loved the world. F-O-R. For God so loved the world. In English language, if anybody starts a sentence and says for whatever, it means you have to look at what was said before that necessitated the use of the word for or because you have to ask yourself why is he saying for for what for god so loved the world why that so you have to go back to what was before it and this is this is what jesus is saying in verse 14 it starts in verse 14 it says and as moses Lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so. Must the son of man be lifted up. Remember we read in John 12. And I if I am lifted up. I will lift up men. And this he said. About what death he should die. What death did he die? On the cross which we celebrate as Good Friday, whether it's Friday or not. He died for us. You understand? He died for us. I actually personally believe he died on a Wednesday, not a Friday. That's my personal belief. But it doesn't matter. He did die. Because the only way you can get three days, three nights is when you start from Wednesday. You can't get three days, three nights when you, when you count from Friday. You really can. But it doesn't matter. He died for us. Technically, three nights Three days. You got to count three nights, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., three nights. And then three days, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., three days. You got to work your way back from before sunrise Sunday. Work your way back. It'll take you as far back as Wednesday. But anyway, doesn't matter. He died for us, right? Watch this. He said, Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so I will be lifted up. Why on earth would Jesus compare himself to a serpent? You ever wondered about that? I didn't make this up. He said it. And then he said, verse 15, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. What did Jesus mean by as Moses lifted up the serpent, I would also be lifted up. Why is Jesus equating his lifting up to the lifting up of a serpent of brass. Why? Jesus is lifted up on the cross. It's equal to or symbolized by the serpent lifted up. The serpent of brass. Because God told Moses, make a serpent of brass and put it on the pole. Why? Because God was telling Moses and the Israelites, this serpent of brass on the pole it's a picture of my son who would be on the pole later on, years later, on the cross to be crucified. The serpent was made of brass. Do you know what brass represents in the Bible? Brass represents judgment. The cross was not a place where God is saying love, love. No, it was a place where God is saying judgment. I will judge the serpent. I will judge the devil. I will crush the devil. I will crush his head. But in crushing his head and in destroying him, he will bruise the heel of my son. My son will suffer on the cross. This is all not new. God said it from the very beginning when we sinned. When our father sinned. When Adam sinned. In Genesis 3.15, God said, 
the seed of the woman, the Virgin Mary, the seed of the woman, will bruise the head of the serpent. But the serpent will bruise his heel. If you bruise somebody's heel, but he is crushing your head, who suffers more? You. If he crushes your head, you suffer more, though you manage to bruise his heel. So Satan managed to bruise the heel of Jesus. He caused him to suffer. But in his sufferings on the cross, Jesus smashed the head of the devil. Next time somebody tells you that witches, principalities and powers, there's a strong man in your city, in your family holding you down, tell them that the devil's head has been crushed. God has stomped on the head of the devil. He judged him on the cross and I am free. If the Son of God sets you free, you are free indeed. Having received this revelation today and been assured of the certainty of these truths that you've heard, now faith is in your heart to receive your deliverance, your healing, your breakthrough. God displayed his love towards you in doing what? In smashing the head of the devil. Just like naturally, if a bully is attacking somebody's child, the mother will fight that bully off. Something's attacking your child. With vengeance, with anger, you will bring all the power that you have, the parent will bring it against whatever is coming against their child. This is what the Father did for us. Amen. Through the Son, by the power of the Spirit, that we may enjoy the Father's love. But to do it, he had to crush the head of the serpent. So he said, Moses, make a serpent of brass to say that I will judge the devil who used the serpent in the garden to deceive Eve and to cause Adam to rebel against God and cause us to fall short of significance, of glory, of honor, of worth, of value. But today, God has brought it to you through Jesus. I want to pray for you. I want to pray in agreement with you. Whatever you need to happen in your life to show that you are free in reality, you are free indeed, we are praying that it will become your portion in the land of the living, whatever it may be. I don't know, but God knows and you know. Even the things you don't know, he will do for you. But let's just believe him. That he has begun a good work and he will bring it to completion. Amen. On the cross, the devil was judged and he lost his authority over you. On the cross, our sins were judged in Jesus paying for us. So you don't owe the devil anything. You don't. You don't have to give anything back to any strong man before you can be free. You don't have to go and do anything extra in any cave, any strange thing. You don't have to send money to anybody before you can be free. You support the work of God. You support ministries, but you don't have to pay God. The word is nigh thee. The word of faith which I've preached to you, that if you believe with your heart that Jesus is the Son of God and that God raised him up from the dead for you and you will confess this or say it with your mouth so that what your heart is saying, your mouth will say the same thing, you'll be saved. Amen. It's not in hell, nor far away in heaven. It is here you have heard. Receive it now. Receive it now. To be born again, you say, Lord Jesus, I receive you. 
as my Savior and as my Lord. Thank you that my sins are washed away. Thank you for what you did for me. Amen. Thank you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will fall upon the audience, will fall upon all participating of this message today. Loose people from captivity in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that they receive their healing. Stretch your hands, O Lord, to heal the sick and deliver the oppressed. In the name of Jesus, I pray that all over the world this season, unbelievers will come to faith in Christ. People receive God who came to save them. That they will be born again. They will have God come live in them by the Spirit of the Lord. I command anything that holds you bound to loose you in Jesus' name. Be released. Be set loose. Be set free in the name of Jesus. Receive your salvation. Receive your healing. Receive your deliverance. Receive your breakthrough in Jesus' name. The Son of God set you free. Be free indeed. Someone has been having pain in their chest. I hear it from the Spirit of God. Even now, God's healing you. Put your hand on your chest. In the name of Jesus. I pray that heart problems be healed. Respiratory, respiratory problems be healed. In Jesus' name. Lungs be healed. Lungs be healed. In Jesus' name. Heart be healed. In the name of Jesus, anything you have going on in your chest area, be healed. Anything respiratory, be healed now in the name of Jesus. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, receive your healing. Receive your healing. Any growth in your body, what God did not put in there, I curse it to perish. Be healed now. Life come to you. Strength come to you in Jesus' name. Just as Jesus said, Moses lifted up the serpent. And those who looked up were healed in Jesus' name. You also be healed and be saved in Jesus' name. By the faith of God, I call it done. And I thank God and I praise God. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank God for salvation. Thank God for healing. Thank God for whatever it is that you needed from God. It is yours. He has begun a good work and he will bring it to completion. Let's thank God. Let's praise God. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for joining me. All right. Go forth. Be a blessing. Amen. God bless you. Love your family. Love people. Just give love as God gave love. God bless. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God bless. Bye-bye for now.